Welcome to the Off the Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And I'm Matt. It's our podcast about anything and everything off road. As always, we're socially distanced. Literally, the only way we can make the show. I'm in the Midwest. Ross is in the Northeast, and Matt's in the Northwest. Like we're going all the way across tonight. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> Seattle. Uh, born and raised. That's fantastic. We got our full country spread again. Yeah, back to our regular time zones of East, yep. Central, and actually, when this will this will come out a couple weeks after I did a show and like this live. This is crazy. I'm sorry. This is gonna. <laughs> That's okay. I, she can, you're okay with it. You can pet her. You can like. We're not worried she, about the visuals so much. You're good. She's. <laughs> yeah <laughs> she said you saved me i'm going to care about you now so yep. <laughs> okay ross i'm going to give you a sweet transition would she like to sit underneath your new awning ah yes i'm sure she would <laughs> that was a great transition yeah uh, my only quick update this week is i met up with um another I hate mutter and bought an awning, bought an Overland Pros 270. Um, it's a, you know, roof mounted, roof rack mounted awning with poles. And now I just have to figure out how to shit rig it to the top of my truck. Nice. And, Zip ties. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Yeah. So yeah. The funny thing, funny thing is I was on Facebook after, uh, after I had, you know, struck the deal to go pick this up on Sunday and I was trying to find crossbars for the Lexus. And, and I found a dude who was selling crossbars and I, sent him a message and we were going back and forth. And I said, Oh, so what year truck did these come off? And he said, Oh, five. So I said, that's not going to work. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I know I'm sorry, guys. I really am. This was not no, no. planned. <laughs> no, no, you're good. I'm, I'm yeah. more laughing at the Oh five. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Wrong, so... wrong GX. Wrong GX. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so he says, but if you're, you know, just to let you know, I'm also selling an awning. It's like, uh, well, the funny story is I was actually planning to go to Jersey to buy an awning. So I texted my brother and asked my brother if he had any interest. So my brother and I drove down to Jersey on Sunday and we picked up two awnings. Nice. Yeah. So he's going to put his on his forerunner. And uh, yeah, his, his is a a fox wing, I think. Okay. It's, yeah. It's, it's like it's a, a little bat bit... wing, but not. Yeah, I think they're all. Like, you call them all like Star Trek, Star. No, what yeah. one is it? That would be Star. It would Wars, be Star Wars. But... <laughs> yeah. I like the Star Trek joke. Uh, yeah. So, oh my god, yeah. I got yeah nerd jokes, uh, bad plays on words. That's all I got. Yep. So that's, that's all I got. Chris. Completely what we're used to. Yep. Um, I, I have my, nothing else interesting. My only update, and I don't think we've talked about it on the show. I don't think we've even we hinted not. at this. Is I bought uh lexus g uh lx 470 not a gx i was yes. i was gx shopping yes. um and we were we were taught, contemplating getting my wife a new vehicle uh because she has a 2008 sequoia um that i just added a lot of marks to but that we'll have <laughs> talked about that previously uh yeah. <laughs> we haven't recorded Everybody it yet but know. it will come out before this yep. yeah um so we found this one locally um 2,000, 200,000 miles on it. Uh, timing belt and water pump has just been done in the last like 800 to 1,000 miles. Nice. Um, KMC wheels, a little bit oversized. Toyota Open Country AT3 is a tire where we are very familiar with and comfortable using. Yeah. I just brutalized the state of Utah with my set on the Sequoia. Um, it's got a two inch Iron Man lift underneath it. The AHC has been disconnected, so I don't have to worry about that failure. Nice. Ooh, good call. It still has the stock radio. Running board delete. Uh, running board delete, and I'll eventually will add sliders. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it needs some sliders there, and obviously it has the Victory roof rack already. And then the grill's been blacked out, and the rear badge has been blacked out as well. Um, all things said, it it is in great shape for the cost we got it at. Was just it it almost feels like a steal. Um, it looks clean, but it's it's got some little finicky things like some interior trim pieces. One of the license plate lights uh, isn't staying in the housing, but like small things that can be adjusted over time um my wife has ch chosen not to daily it she's actually gonna let this be our uh 14 year old's first vehicle when he starts getting his restricted license later this summer we're gonna start driving to school and work on his own so um That's i like the truck to start with yeah it was like it's way better the than what yeah i did not have anything nearly that cool so um yeah and hopefully i will 
keep using the Sequoia to do off-roady things since it's the one that's already armored up. So, but it's all wheel drive. I love it. It just, it's great. So cool. we hadn't talked about it on the show yet. So that's my little update. And now we can talk about Matt. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. My favorite so, cars. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so Matt, why don't you give us your little elevator pitch? Tell us who you are. Tell the audience who you are, uh, uh, how you got to where you are in the auto and whatever point of the industry that you've got your fingers in these days. All right. This is just, <laughs> I can't, this is the elephant in the room or the, the, yeah. the hippo <laughs> in the room. Um, no, uh, I don't know. I, from Seattle originally, uh, I've lived all over the world, traveled extensively, but cars have always been the, the focal point. It's one of those, you know, did people choose to be gay? No. <laughs> did they choose to be car people? No. 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 Absolutely. No. Completely. I got, I got two for two on that one. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It, cars have always been a huge passion. It's what I wake up thinking about. It's what I go to sleep thinking about. And I've been lucky enough to navigate a career that has kept me in the automotive sphere. And that a lot of people say, you know, well, if you're if you have a hobby that you can make money at, it's never a job or that. Right. Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it also cuts the other way too, where does that diminish your enthusiasm for the hobby if that is your job? Right. And in my case, not at all. It's what I love doing. It's what I love talking about. It's what I love, uh, you know, being a proselytizer, yeah. on-road, off-road race cars, off-road race cars. It's just, I don't know. I don't know how else I would be. I don't know how else to, to be me. Where'd you start in the car world? Interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I'll i make it brief, hopefully. Not one of my strong suits. But um, no, it was uh, just days after 9-11, actually. I had graduated okay. high school and uh, I wanted to go sell cars. I actually had a full scholarship from the Air Force uh, in, for college. I had an Air Force Academy appointment and I just, for a variety of reasons, decided I wanted to, you know, over that summer, wanted to go sell cars. And days after 9-11, there was this, uh, you know, pro-America thing. And one of the guys in the area had a, an American flag on the tip of a, an antenna from a Chevy, which I identified. I'm like, Hey, so what's the story? And he's like, Oh, I work at the Chevy store. I'm like, Oh, can you get me a job? And that was it. It's crazy. So I started selling cars and I don't know. It, it, I like people. I like talking to people. I like getting to know people. And I've been accused of being, you know, a consummate salesman or something, but to me, it's genuine. <laughs> I really, truly, truly enjoy talking to people. And mm -hmm. uh, so it makes it an easy uh, you know, career to be in. So you eventually ended up at a couple of the old magazines that the uh, more hardcore guys kind of chased after crawl and Jeep freak. So how'd you end up there? And, and well, first, first, how'd you end up there? What was that like? And I mean, you got any like favorite stories right off the bat from, from those yeah, last days? Got a, I've got a couple of good ones. I'll make them, I'll again, try and be brief. So I was an English major and I've always enjoyed photography and telling stories. And so back when forums were, you know, how you communicated with fellow enthusiasts, that's, mm -hmm. that was where you met. And so I started doing these uh, trip reports. We'd go off-roading, we'd go to EJS, we'd go to Moab, we'd do uh, snow wheeling, we'd go to, you know, wherever. And I started writing these up and it became more and more lengthy and more and more professional. And I got contacted by uh, Frank Ledwell at Jeep Freak said, do you want to be an actual contributor? Or it was first, it was like, can we just use this? And I'm like, sure, fine. Mm -hmm. And it, that evolved. And it was, I think, 2007. I was at uh, Easter Jeep Safari with uh, Jeep Freak and that was an online publication at the time. So it was, 
yeah, but still is. Obviously, the, the goal of anybody who is a burgeoning journalist is to see their name in print right. on paper in an actual right. magazine, right? And this is back yeah. when magazines still existed. And so we were at EJS, and everybody had gone home from uh, the bar. Uh, God, what's that bar in Moab called? Woody's. Woody's Tavern. I said there's not a lot, so. <laughs> yeah. Woody's, Woody's Tavern. And back then, you had to have a membership. Okay. Utah law is if they were serving hard alcohol, you actually had to have an actual membership. So you had to buy That's a amazing. card. No, it was, I mean, whatever. It's, it's yeah. what it is. It's hysterical. Well, because it's so, Utah. Like, right. Because Utah, right? <laughs> oh, here's yeah. your 3.5% beer. I don't know why they're from Minnesota, but. And you can't have doubles. You have to have a separate whatever. So I was, there it is, Woody's Tavern, uh, world famous. So I was in there. All my buddies went home. I was going to have one last round. I was going to walk back to our condo. And I see this group of people at the bar wearing jackets, these like sort of cheese ball jackets, but they all said Chrysler Motor Company or Jeep on them. And so I walked up. I'm like, are you guys with Chrysler by any chance? Is that, are you guys with, with Jeep? And they're like, yeah, yeah. What, who are you? What do you do? I'm like, oh, well, I'm Matt with Jeep Freak Magazine, you know, kind of this and that and so forth. I'm like, what are you doing tomorrow morning at seven? Like, I was hoping to sleep in, but what do you got? <laughs> it, was the, it was the Mopar Underground uh, Chrysler, uh, you know, release of their all the prototypes. Wow. And that was the very first time they showed the JT, which was the concept that eventually turned into what we know as the gladiator today. Yep. And uh, I was one of the first people on the planet to drive it and shoot it. And I came back to the condo and I'm like, oh man, you wouldn't believe what just happened. And uh, uh, the guys from Crawl Magazine were like, can you, can you like, you know, get us in? And I'm like, no, I can't, but I can write the article and you can make me a, you know, a stringer. Mm -hmm. and this is like 2007. Uh, yeah, I think so. 2008, maybe. Okay. I, I just, I, I don't I know if it was this end. concept or night. That's the one. That's it right there. Yep. I remember that. I have pictures of me driving that rig. It'd be oh, a truck. great rig. <laughs> Seriously. How many it's, people it's, have built trucks like that since? Well, uh, I mean, you know, of course, the, the Brute AEV yep. did, yep. Um, you know, yep. that was and the before. JK8 kit that Mopar did. Which I compared to the EV, I was a well. The right. difference is that AEV's building the brutes, and people who have probably never put one together on the JK8 are putting them together for the first time. Um, but yeah, anyway, so that's how I got my first big break. Okay, was sticking around after uh, for a free beer from the guys from Moper Underground, Mark Allen. Um. And yeah, and then from there, it was the next month. It's like, oh, do you want to do some more articles? And then it was eventually I was a senior editor uh, for Crawl. Mm -hmm. And it was a really cool thing to do. Were you already deep into the off-roading world at that point? Or was this kind of just like a trajectory you took because you saw an opportunity? It was somewhat accidental. I Again, when we first started, I've always been a car person, an automotive uh, an autophile or whatever you call it. <laughs> and I you started with that. <laughs> I started with sporty cars and go fast stuff. Mm -hmm. And you know, I had enough tickets that it was time to not have super fast yeah. cars. I was literally at the dealership I was working at and I was in my uh, S54 M Roadster nice. and it started snowing and I couldn't get out of my parking spot. Like I literally like put it in reverse and the tires just spun. And earlier that day, I had taken in trade a 1994 white two-door Jeep Cherokee. And I'm like, oh shit, I'll just take this home tonight and you know, just get mm -hmm. and able to get home. And I fell in love with it. Like it was it was nimble, it was light, it was five speed manual, four liter, two door. It was a delight. It was a, a super fun car to drive. Yeah. And so then I started Googling, like, what can you do to a Jeep Cherokee? And, oh, my gosh, you can actually get them <laughs> off-road. And so I became an off-road guy. And uh, so I bounced back and forth between 
road racing, sporty car stuff and mm -hmm. uh, off road. And I, I've decided that both are fun enough that I don't need to choose one. Yeah. That's I'm just sharing your whole Instagram profile because it's fantastic. Cause it's literally like off road stuff mixed with sporty cars, <laughs> yeah. like all over the place. Yep. Like this image by itself. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Right. That, that, that's, that's a... my, my two car solution currently. Uh, the red car is a S50 M3 swapped uh, E30. And then my LC100, obviously, it's, you know, really, really built. Really, really big fan of those. I, I, yeah. I think I might buy one. You should. I'd recommend a white <laughs> one, maybe a left. Uh, you know, yeah. I my brothers. That's great. I personally do enjoy the Lexus front end better, but that's just me. <laughs> I never did it. Same. until lately and now i'm like hmm uh. <laughs> the thing is, i had a gx I had a, I had a gx 470 uh before and okay. I that a lot but and i'm sorry ross but the language okay. are so much better it's just the, what uh, is the, the cruiser is oh, oh, I, dude, I like it so much more you don't have I'm to sorry. apologize i know that the gx uh, i yeah that's the jeeks yeah we we called it a jeeks uh, <laughs> because i've always been a jeep person historically oh, i'm known for being a jeep guy but so yeah yeah that was the jeeks uh that's what it became known as <laughs> kind of like that <laughs> how, all right so how does taking a two-door xj home eventually find its way into building a full-on lemons race car out of out of an xj to clarify for anybody who's actually you know questioning things here well so the thing about the the xj in its stock form weighs 2,900 pounds. It's a unibody. It's rear wheel drive. You can buy them stock as two wheel drive. Mm -hmm. That's a fairly reasonable formula for a, mm. a decent, inexpensive, yep. dead nuts, reliable car. And so for an endurance racing series that has a $500 budget cap, that Sounds like a perfect recipe. And that so I went and found a $200 one. Oh, the good old days. <laughs> right? Jeez. Uh, yeah. Put a paint job on it and a roll cage and wheels and tires. And remarkably good. That's crazy. I mean, the pictures of those things that you've done on the track, it, it looks so silly, but... It looks like, amazing. What are you talking about? There's nothing silly about that. It's coming onto the front straight at Laguna Seca, <laughs> crossed up sideways in the rain. Yeah, yeah. With yeah. Leader LS and a 256. Oh, uh, Jesus. It evolved quite a bit from the $200 drag out of the the weeds into what it has evolved into. And you know, the wing is ridiculous. You know, it's obviously, yeah. but that's a play on words with petty cash. You know, like not yeah. much money. Richard mm -hmm. Petty. Richard Petty. Ricky yep. Superbird, you know, kind of thing. I love all of this. This is fantastic. It's great. <laughs> well, uh... It's been a huge chunk of my life for, geez, my first race was 09. Oh, wow. Was same car. It's That's it's wild. a lot. Yeah. Is there, I don't think there's anybody else doing that with XJs. So, Not on guitar back. So I made the recipe and there's eight or nine of them. Really? That have used my 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 setup and the thing oh. about the two-wheel drive xj is it's a solid front axle mm -hmm. with no guts it's just a tube just open yeah and so what we've figured out so was adding some camber so we would do offset ball joints and then ultimately we would notch the tube like a little pie cut bend it and then re-weld it so that you had um some fixed camber because otherwise you just scrape the offside of the the outside of the tires off mm. um on on the road tracks but what okay so i guess what are the other teams what are they generally running for rear axle and diffs and and what's in the ls powered one we run a 488 which i've okay. had huge luck with over the years mm -hmm. yeah so a 31 spline uh 96 explorer axle which comes with disc brakes which is mm -hmm. another you know upgrade yeah. bonus um, and you can get anywhere between uh, 307s to 410 gears stock. Hmm. Um, and they're strong as all get out. And they have limited slips. Right. It's like the just 
perfect uh, yeah. addition. And so those the Cherokees obviously are sprung over, meaning the axle tube is below the leaf pack. Mm-hmm. And so what we did is we converted them to spring under, uh, which is both to lower it and also to control axle wrap. Um, okay, that makes sense. How, and then we there... just sorry. Go. No, I was I was just going to ask if there's any aside from the cage, any other body bracing that you you did to make them. You know, it's a unibody; it's not going to flop that much. But yeah, I mean, we time it's, it's a, time. You know, you know, a t- eight twelve point cage or something. You know, it's it's significant. And sadly, so this is very, very, very early days. That's before we did the wide body uh, yeah. version. So that was a stock four liter automatic when we first got it. And we gradually adapted it to have a full manual controls because it's an uh, electronically controlled transmission. So basically a full manual valve body, but using solenoids. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we were able to completely control when the car shifted and uh it was also really it's one of those things people go an automatic race car yeah but when you're paying more attention to your braking points and your apex uh, you're faster than you would be trying to Mm -hmm. you know heel toe double clutch rev match yeah and then you slide off into the weeds unless uh, you have a lot of other track experience in a car with a stick and if you're sharing a car with four drivers, which is the the formula, and you're relying on people you may not have raced with before, mm-hmm. I mean Jim Hall, Chaparral, right? Yep. Those cars were all automatics. Mm-hmm. It's, I'm not the only idiot who's done this. I mean, there's <laughs> two of us that I now. That's what race cars are now, you know. So, so yeah, yeah, that's Laguna Seca coming across the finish. Um, with an E30. Do you yeah, guys right. know Bill Caswell? Yes. Yes, so we're familiar with that's, Bill. Yes, that's, that's, I don't know him, but I am familiar. Uh, uh-huh. That's uh, Bill was racing that car that weekend. <laughs> well, Bill tends to and like E30s. We're faster than that car, dramatically faster. I'm sure he loved that. <laughs> Bill's a good friend of mine. Um, uh, and yeah, the best thing about the Cherokee, and this is the best thing, is. Uh, they're virtually indestructible, but at the end of the day, and people are, you know, in the paddock having a beer, there's no like, oh, what, what car were you driving? Oh, uh, the the white BMW. Oh, which right. one? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 that one. I was like, oh, yeah, with the one with the sliver. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's like, hey, what car were you driving? The Jeep. Holy crap. Yeah. You know, it's, um, and that's actually Dave Cole from King of the Hammers getting strapped into that right now. Oh, really? Awesome. Yeah. Do they, are these intakes down here? Uh, brake duct. Brake ducts. Brake ducts. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, do you know? You guys know Pirate Four by Four? Oh yeah. So go back to that picture. I also saw the NA actually. I played on the. On yeah. The, when it was in its early days. Yes. Yeah, so the old four uh, days are. Uh, so yeah, Nax, Team Naxa. So the guy in the red there, uh, mm-hmm. that's Cam. The dude in the red fire suit. Yeah. That's Camo from Pirate Four by Four. Okay. There's Lance Clifford. Uh, and then it was uh, the two owners of Pirate 404. That's the mm-hmm. other founder. And oh, he came so out fun. with Dave and Dave's kid, uh, Bailey, who's now killing it in racing Broncos um, and all sorts of other fun stuff. Okay. So, Say, so didn't she sorry, just win at Hammers? Say it. I thought she just won at Hammers. Wasn't that this year? So that's Bailey Campbell. You're thinking Campbell, Bailey okay. Cole. That's Shannon Campbell's daughter. Bailey Cole is Dave Cole's son, which is an understandable. Yeah, I know. <laughs> right. It's a lot. Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll get. I'll keep up eventually. Too many so, Google searches. Sorry. Go ahead, Ross. I want to talk hammers. Yeah, just, that was going to transition just, to that. Yeah. Just alluded to it very briefly. So you uh, you just got back. Were you part of a team that was competing or were you there spectating and and playing around? This year, I had a wild hair and just went down to, when I was a journalist, I went down to King of the Hammers when they released the new Wrangler MTR, uh, the Kevlar. That yeah. was in what, like 2009 or something, eight? Uh, yeah, a long time ago the, the release was in Palm Springs the week before KOH. 
And I asked oh. the the media rep, I'm like, do you guys mind if my re- my free return ticket is a week later? Like, oh, we don't care. Mm-hmm. So I went and did the MTR release in Johnson Valley, did all their you know press stuff, and then stayed for a few days. Those are the tires, and and I sort of just made my way out to Johnson Valley, and Dave Cole and uh, Jeff Knoll, the two founders of KOH. I sort of wandered up with like a backpack, a a camera and know where to stay, no food, no nothing. And they're like, Oh, Hey, you come here. And there was this scissor lift and we were, they were trying to hang the banners on the, like the start finish arch. Oh my God. And it was like the, what you'd have at a Costco, like, and this is off road. Yeah. And so they had me up 30 (laughs) feet and they're like, Hey, you come here. I'm like, you know, the, the, it was utterly terrifying. That's uh, so I held, I hung the banners, and and then they connected me with some uh, some people, and I traded a handle of bourbon for a place to sleep for the week, and that was my first experience with uh, King of the Hammers. And then as Dave started growing the series, he called me and was like, "I don't know how to run a, I don't know how to organize a race, I don't know how to do timing and scoring, I don't know how to do all the official mm-hmm. stuff, and you're a race car driver." I'm like, I have a two wheel drive Jeep Cherokee. Right. <laughs> uh, I, had more experience, I had more experience. So uh, they brought me on to do like timing and scoring and some of the officiating. Uh, I was eventually the uh, chief tech inspector for the series. I helped write the rule book here and there. And uh, that in 12 years, I've been doing that a month at a time. So <laughs> you show up. And there's nothing there. It's a complete empty desert. Right. And you're in an RV. And then you build the town. We have a survey crew. You know, everything is marked out. And you're literally like drawing out the the map of Hammertown and marking course and everything. Mm-hmm. The infrastructure is it's a hundred thousand people who show up. Yeah. With this into a place with population of zero the week before. Right. It's it's, it's imposing. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's how I got involved in that. Okay. You're catching a theme here. It's this accidentally stumbling yeah. into. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, what's you know, your what's your involvement now? So I am my uh, good friend, and yeah, that's Hammertown. That is completely empty before oh, we get there, and it's completely empty after we get there. Or it is we get, rather literally like from an aerial perspective, it is Burning Man for off roaders. Where Halloween meets gasoline, and yeah, it's yeah. the the Burning Man reference is a really uh, uh, apropos, I think, in a lot of ways. Very different uh, demographic. So, just <laughs> <a little>. <laughs> <laughs> also, this and that's not even uh, there are, but it does run the gamut. There are so many different people from so many different places. I think for both events. Mm-hmm. Which is the cool part. You get to meet people you would never expect to, and that's um, a cool thing. Yep. The the night photos out there always get me of just like how absolutely colorful and wild they look. Oh, like, man. yeah, it's um. Well, speaking of Burning Man, actually, a, a buddy of mine named Ian uh, has this rig called uh, Big Willie, and it's a one and a half scale Willis MB, like early Jeep but it's uh, based on Rockwell axles and it's this giant thing. Oh, and uh, he takes it out there and it, you know, shoots flames out of the, it was built for Burning Man, but it's also mm-hmm. a functional, uh, you know, Rockwell axle, yeah. dual lockers, 47, 52 inch tall tire, Jesus. something like that. And so he does both of those events and that's, so there is some crossover. Oh, the Venn diagram does have a, an overlap and that's, uh it's pretty cool that's so good chris i hope you can find a picture of that thing i'm kind of curious i'm dying to see that yeah. well, Big Willie. It, is it the mutant jeep that they're calling it is it dark green and gigantic uh yeah the oh, come on google just want for i never want Google's small good, images now. just give me the big images forever yeah, like i don't want small set ones. a preference on that <laughs> looks like where we started uh, so the one on the right is, the one on the left is a real World War II vintage uh, Willys MB. Mm-hmm. The one on the right is four-wheel steer, 
that's huge. Yeah, I mean that's it's it's ridiculous. But he takes that to Burning Man. It's a, he's a huge Burning Man um, advocate, but also an off road guy. And again, so, there's no reason you can't do both, right? Like every single body panel on that costume. Yeah, yeah, Jesus, crazy. Yeah, crazy. well, like if you just see it without the other Jeep next to it, it it just it, looks big. But like, yeah. Look how small the person is. The person is your oh now. Exactly yeah. Right. It's not a that's... child. <laughs> it's like and a that's... mega raptor or something. The cool thing about KOH and for that matter, Burning Man is none of this makes sense. Why would yeah. anybody do any of this? <laughs> and it doesn't matter because it's just cool. And I don't know. I think car people in particular have to own up to that because mm. none of this makes sense. It's just an ex no. extremely expensive way to light dollar bills on fire. <laughs> but yeah. it's really fun. I, don't, I mean, it's it, it doesn't have to make sense, I guess, is my point. Yeah. I mean, you know, the trope about being a car enthusiast is like it's there's nothing in it that's not emotional. You know, because if there was no emotion involved, cars to everybody would just be like the point to point A to B kind of stuff. Appliances. Lit yeah, yeah. Liter they'd literally be appliances. Yeah. But because we have emotions and we like experiencing things and seeing things and smelling things and, you know, climbing up or going over things that give us adrenaline, it's it's a yeah, a good way to set money on fire. Well, I, I, I alluded to it earlier, alluded to it earlier, but the reason I off-roading became an attractive alternative to super, driving super fast uh, and getting tickets was you get the same adrenaline rush at two miles an hour that you do at 122 miles an hour. And it's mm -hmm. much safer, much in, a, in many, many, many ways. <laughs> and super less uh, expensive with your traffic lawyers. I don't know. It's it's a different experience, and you also are out in nature, and it's beautiful, and you're in the mountains, mm -hmm. and you go camping with your buddies and your friends, and it it's a it's a a lifestyle. I hate that term, but yep, it is a thing, and it's a, it's addictive, and it's great for the most mm -hmm. part. Uh, for the most part, well. Not having to see Trump flags off the back of uh, UTV, <laughs> you know that's not my uh, particular brand of bourbon. But yeah, oh, no, no, no. I have actually had a lot of um, a lot of people who have been welcoming to a broad variety of different r lifestyles within the off road world. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's been a, an interesting dynamic, which I'm not trying to make this about that, but <laughs> both in racing and especially off-road racing, uh, being in the LGBT community, I mean, it's a, a different vibe than anything else. Mm -hmm. Do, have you found it to be people are trying to think of how to phrase this are, are people just generally unaware of it or uneducated about it and then like you have to break down that barrier or is it just sheer ignorance and and once they realize that you know opening and acceptance is the better way to live you get past that yeah and it's again and this is not the focus of your <laughs> podcast right? totally get it hey we're happy but to it, talk about this stuff it's, it's important stuff um, now I've had incredibly to me important interactions with people who had never met a gay person before in their life. Yep. And they certainly had, but they didn't know. And it was that guy who was on the float at a pride parade or something like right. it wasn't a real person. Right. It was a, a facsimile. It was a. Mm -hmm. A, a comical impression of and to be able to be an actual person who can turn a wrench build a race car 
it humanizes and makes people understand that it's not the it's not a pride float right Your, my life is not a pride float it is i'm a real human being i have a real big boy job i have uh, a adopted puppy who's snoring like a, <laughs> a chainsaw now next to me and we can't um, hear it which is great <laughs> yeah i don't have to edit that later <laughs> but i like i like race cars i like uh um, action movies and guns and i mean i it, it's not a binary one or the other kind of thing mm -hmm. and i've had a lot of really important interactions i feel like with people who have called me or messaged me or emailed or whatever later saying yeah my my little brother just told me he was gay and i would not have known how to handle it if i hadn't mm -hmm. had some interactions with with you and Right. Again, I'm not trying to like take credit for any of that <laughs> stuff, but it's it's it, it's good to see people out of the cliche. Uh, you know, I'm not here to be your your fashion designer, fat. You know, like yeah. personal shopper, whatever. It's it's good to see that both can exist. Mm -hmm. yep. Absolutely, and, and it echoes that, Chris. I think we we were talking about this on. An episode we recorded recently but everybody has a car experience and cars there's a through line that can kind of unify anybody who's had anything to do with them ever and it you know it makes a big world smaller you know and it and whether it's stuff yeah. like this or having other... a common a common uh a common passion a common enthusiasm yeah. you know it's mm -hmm. all of a sudden it becomes less the world becomes less awful when you know, you're you're uh, talking all of a sudden you're talking to some random person and you're talking about i just think it's like all right so if you're an airplane guy like you you walk into a bar and you're like oh you see guys doing the oh i was, I was right behind them you know and then there's the gun guys and they're like oh yeah i was right there yeah. and there's the bike guys and they're like oh yeah i was right there and the car mm -hmm. guys oh, i was right there we're all the same people yeah you know and the hand the, you, you can you knitting people probably have the same uh <laughs> whatever you know it's yeah it, they're it, different it, different bars from us but <laughs> it, it, i mean exactly it's like i was just gonna say they're all italian because they're all talking with their hands like <laughs> the, the pizza makers yeah <laughs> but at the end of the day we're all just people and we all have yeah. uh passions and yeah. i love cars and that has been my you know driving past uh, it's a terrible cliche but yeah uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah I'm sorry <laughs> sorry sorry i was not even intentional I'm sorry. Uh, no it's good it's good um uh, but yeah i don't know uh cars are my life right now i am the sales director at a uh we're a very very niche small porsche shop in the seattle area um historically we've been gorgeous things Whoa. we yeah one owner irish green 912 um good god um yeah so 914 i'm just gonna sit I, here and clip through pictures yeah, now and, because and i'm that, infatuated I mean, this you, is what i want i want a 356 sorry well you certainly we, sorry no i was gonna I, say i only have bug uh budget for a bug though so <laughs> <laughs> um they're the same thing you've you've posted a lot of pictures of a lot of fast Porsches on your, uh, on your social media. So it's like, you didn't want to stay in that world full time. So now it's just the job. And <laughs> like, I was never a Porsche guy until super recently. Uh, well, super recently, but I mean, Porsche is fine. Cool. Yeah. 911. Yeah. Yeah. Fast engine, Nazi wagon, blah, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> and I accidentally bought a Boxster about Six, six years ago it was too cheap to not buy mm -hmm. and i found myself just falling in love with it it was just so good and this sounds like a, a thing rich people would say like well until you have owned one you really don't understand mm -hmm. you know yes you know it's this, silver uh, sorry is that it uh well that's one of them but yeah that's also one of mine uh, this is the the launch color, silver over boxster red leather, which is another one of my kinks. But the color I, or the launch colors, red interior happens to oh. be one of my uh, one of my things. 
On the same page there, brother. Red Guts work on everything. Facebook page. That's mine. Especially uh, with a gray exterior. Like, I love that. Like The contrast is what I'm, yes. I, I dig. For so many, for the last 15 years, it's been black with black interior, white with black interior, silver with black interior, gray. It just, it's, it's been so boring. And I think people are really embracing the variety of color combinations. And uh, I am all for it. Pink totally Porsche. The pink Porsche is the... Which is currently Bro. the cover photo of my Facebook group. Is it? Nice. <laughs> There is it go. the color is frozen frozen berry metallic i believe yeah 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 that's the word um yep. speaking of uh matt i uh met him actually at the lemons race when he nice. was on the car show oh my Adam god Carolla. yeah and disaster uh, uh dan <laughs> neal from wall street dan journal neal. yeah and uh oh god a basketball yeah. player which i don't yeah. follow basketball john sally but... john sally yeah. Yeah. so Okay. This is a sports Here's person. John Sally, good job. I was contacted by the organizers of Lemons because I am a firearms enthusiast mm -hmm. in a responsible, we need to, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Yep, yep, yep. They asked me if I could bring some guns to the race because at this race in Reno, John Sally, Matt Farah, Corolla, we're going to do this episode. It was a full 24 hour race, mm -hmm. 24 hours straight through. And they have to have the shooting range at the track. And they thought, wouldn't it be hilarious if the, and here's where the, uh, what like, if the team drove a car and then it's, uh, you know, we had to shoot it at the end, you know, this it mm -hmm. made up, uh, challenge. Uh, yep. Yeah, which was totally, and they, they wanted to shut the race down for half an hour midway through so that we could stage a thing. I mean, just like reality TV, uh, like Nothing. overload. But they did give us a budget for ammunition. And so I brought two AR 15s and an AK 47. And I sawed a Nissan three uh, Z32, a Nissan 300ZX in half that they had been racing all weekend. And I was also the range master teaching Dan Neal, John Sally, and Matt Farad how to. <laughs> oh boy! Oh I swear boy! To God, this is true. I can't make this shit up, you guys. I, like, I, seriously, oh this is so absurd that it can't be imaginary. That was something that only could have been done back then, like. It wouldn't happen the same way today with the way the so shell put, was going to do it. We put Tannerite and an acetylene bag in the car. So Tannerite is a binary explosive and acetylene is an explosive. Uh, and we spent eight minutes with them trying to hit the target. The tanner. <laughs> oh, and nobody could. And so I finally grab a rifle and I'm just like, fine. Yeah, fuck this. Um, kaboom! And it was like you know, they're they're. This is what happened when lemons. You know, twenty four hours of lemons blows your cars up. And, mm. You know, it was total reality TV nonsense. But yeah, again, these are the behind the scenes things. You right? Why am I not surprised that TV wanted to blow a car up? Like right? Look well, like I've never trailer. shot a car before. I'd never shot a car before, and so I was like, ooh. <laughs> I can shoot a car. Right. <laughs> it's funny in that picture that Chris just had up of you shooting uh, with the Land Cruiser in the background of the snow. It kind of looks like you're shooting at the cruiser. Targets are just to the right. <laughs> are they? It was, yeah. It's a hundred yard. It's a hundred yard range. That was just our uh, our, our blocker. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. No, I was not shooting my Land Cruiser. Yeah, be, I, I hope not. Said, yeah. Sacrilege, yeah. <laughs> but it was again one of those, and we actually. Oh my god. See, Ross, they're, they're over here. Targets are over here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I have the screen. If you're that far so off. There we go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that race was a full 24, like I said. And the Reno Fernley Raceway, which is now uh, no longer existing, is near the Mustang Ranch, which is a whorehouse. Right. A legal brothel. And they put some of the gals up in the corner stations <laughs> in the middle of the night when it was actually snowing and also it's a open range literally like a 
where wild Mustangs, and I'm not talking about the cars, I'm talking about the horses. So th in the driver's meeting, it's look out for must uh, horsey horses. <laughs> and also, it, it, so it was snowing. I was looking out for Mustang horses and gals from the Mustang ranch in the corner stations in a Jeep Cherokee after having shot a car into half. It was just, it's the most ridiculous thing. And it was literally snowing. Um, we won that race. We won the grand prize. I did not have enough money to get home had we not won. So we were able to actually sleep in a hotel that night Ooh. Uh, on the tow home. So I don't know, man. I'm not, I, I can't, that's I can't like, make shit up. <laughs> that's just utter madness. <laughs> So yeah. Anyway, that's that's me in a nutshell. That's fucking funny. <laughs> Chris, where do you want to go from there? I don't even know where to go from there. I I, I want to go back to the old Porsches. Can we do that? <laughs> yeah, that probably would be uh, more beneficial towards my you know future employment and stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> I went on the show and I didn't plug. <laughs> yeah. Job. The thing. Yeah. So I'm just basically, about old bullshit from 15 years ago. <laughs> any generation of Porsche shows up. Uh, so we right now literally have anything from, uh, the very first, oh my Jesus. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I guess we're doing this. I have driven the very first Porsche that ever won a race ever. Okay. Okay. It, it's a Gamund coupe that won Le Mans. It's the very, very, very first Porsche to ever enter and win a race. Hmm. Uh, I was 14 and I had family friends who were involved in the Monterey historics. Okay. And uh, Chuck Forge owned this car and it had been converted to a, uh, a convertible. It was bright red and had been campaigned for years and years and years um, that way. And then Rod Emery, who I also raced lemons with, uh, I actually pushed his car across the finish line. Swear to God. <laughs> oh, Swear man. to God. I again can't make this up. At uh, ORP in uh, 2013 or something like that. I didn't know it was the same car until not that long ago. And I'm like, oh my God, I've driven the very first Porsche to win a race. And it was because Sam Posey, who was working for Speed uh speed vision back then right mm -hmm. uh needed it moved so we could push el caballo out of its pit space next to the other car and so chuck's like hey hop in and just pull it forward i was 14 and uh little did you know little i mean i knew it was a interesting old you know bathtub porsche but mm -hmm. that's the car number 46 that's funny. and so rob has since converted it back from a, a speedster a convertible to uh, to the coupe which i'm conflicted about a little bit because that car has so much history it was comp it was it raced in scca from yeah my god yeah but as a convertible it raced in the early early days of scca back when california you know it's where guys would come from the war and they had a little bit of cash and yeah. They it, it it had so much provenance as a convertible to undo it. I get why. I mean, it's the most valuable portion in the world theoretically, but it also breaks my heart a tiny. We lost lost all of that West Coast sports car early history. Again, I under I, I see both sides. Yep. But yeah, I've driven that car. That's crazy. That's awesome. Yeah, that it, it doesn't like you can only go down from there. <laughs> Which at fourteen is like kind of welcome to my life. Yeah, <laughs> can tall people fit in three fifty sixes? They're built for German people, so they're not they're not impossible. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm a little short of six four, so that's why I, <laughs> I got a car for you. Starts with I B, would take the. I would Beatles. say back yeah. when it was the sawed off roof one would probably be the the better. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, my, sorry, uh, three, two, six is yes. We work on those. We sell those. My business partner is Dominic Dobson, who is a okay. somewhat, uh, he's done some things in racing. I forget what they are, but 
it, it was seven website. starts at uh, Indy 500 and uh, Le Mans and uh, Craftsman Truck. And to me, the best part was racing a Dodge Stratus. Yeah, Speed Vision Cup. Like, uh, that was the best racing. That was so cool. And I'm sad we don't have that kind of stuff anymore. Anyway, so Dominic is a longtime friend of mine and he runs the service side of the business and I run the sales side. And so we buy and sell and represent um, interesting and unique cars, Mm -hmm. electric cars. Um, Is he an older gentleman? Oh, he's really old. Like, <laughs> I wasn't going to call him out for that. But. I not wait to show him this. Yes. He's very, <laughs> very. Oh, that's funny. I, I turned 40 in like two weeks. So, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, jokes are a little uh, <laughs> on point, but yeah. <laughs> I completely so, understand. But yeah, uh, so Dominic uh, is obviously a very accomplished race car driver. He's actually going back to uh, the Le Mans Historics coming up soon, racing the car that he raced at Le Mans in uh, 1912, I think what it was. 1912. (laughs) Uh, I think 92. Okay. Porsche 962, maybe 94, something like that. Um, but, uh, the bright red Fuji, uh, 962, uh, which caught on fire dramatically during that event. Um, rarely gonna, does catching do on fire not happen dramatically. That's a fair, that's a, yep. That's, oh, that's the one. Yeah. That's, that's the one. one. Jeez. That's the one. Is. Yeah. That's the one. Is, is that picture taken at speed or is he stopped already? Um, I think that's him sliding off the side and then he hops out and it burns to the ground. But they built the car back, the same car, and he's going to go drive it again in a month and a half. So, yeah. So that next is, time I talk uh, to you, I'll be the uh, I'll be running the service and sales side. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a that's not a morbid joke at all. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that's not in, a... in this in this, in this uh, line of work. You've got to have a dark sense of humor uh, if you're going to strap into a, a race car. Uh, I will say one of the things about modern racing or even even lemons, you know, wearing Hans devices, we've got, mm-hmm. you know, head to toe fire safety gear, the helmets, the shoes, the gloves, the boots, everything is it's you can still hurt yourself for sure. But the adaptation of modern safety stuff has really taken a lot of mm-hmm. uh, the, the truly scary stuff away from from racing yeah. in my mind i mean i'm sure everybody at this point has seen the grosjean the you know his crash a couple of years ago and they got his car on yeah display right now and like safety trickles down you know and in amateur racing too so so i i, I had the terrible turn of phrase of the roman romaine candle when i was watching that <laughs> event happen live <laughs> It was yeah. It was it, super scary. I was it, so hungover, and <laughs> I was sitting there in bed, and my heart like stopped. It was like thirty seconds of. I had to hungover. walk around. I was like, "Did I just watch that dude die like that?" Have you seen Senna? Have you seen the? Oh yeah, yeah. As a as a racer, as a person who not also just a racer, but also a guy who does the tech sheets and mm-hmm. verifies that your gear is good, that your cage is good, that all this stuff. Yeah, I yeah. mean it's. I've been, I was the tech inspector at a, a race where uh, someone died on with the car I did the tech inspection for. It was. That's I, heavy. I, yeah. I can't describe. Luckily, I mean, not luckily, but he ended up the, the he had a, a heart attack and he died before he hit the wall. Right. It was unrelated and to the, the safety. And of the all car. the safety gear. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. yeah. No, uh, no, all no, the no, safety no. gear worked. And he would have lived through it, but had he not previously that, had a heart attack, right. had he not died before he hit the wall, yeah. Mm-hmm. But that twelve hours between the the uh, uh, what's that mortician? What's the yeah. the coroner? Coroner, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ooh, wow, that was a that was a night. Yeah, I'm yep. sure. Yep. <laughs> oh man, uh, there's no such thing as perfect. You can. 
Well, you just you do the best you can. You try real hard, and you know. And I was a huge uh, advocate for King of the Hammers of adopting some safety stuff from the road racing world. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted it. I got so much pushback. I can't run around on the rocks in those fireproof boots. Okay, well, sure, but you have third degree burns on your feet now yeah you're not running anymore i'm at not all. gonna yeah I'm, you can't ever, run if yeah. you don't have feet i'm not gonna wear those to gloves run. i can't okay well hans device i can't see around and all of these things have become mandatory now mm. in the in that period of time yeah. and yeah. it's it was such a push it was incremental you know it's like oh, i don't need that shit I'm right here. Mm. we had a guy race once in a welding jacket what I mean, it's like, technically fireproof. <laughs> just thing. It's the like the rest of him. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like, that's not, I was like, I'm a firefighter. I got these boots here. I'm like, yeah, they're the, whatever. <laughs> it's fireproof. It only goes down to like. Yeah, yeah it goes to my, my, my rib cage. Right. That's not Nothing a fire important suit. Below that's your not a fire cage. suit, homie. You're not. <laughs> it's not <gonna> work. <laughs> uh, fun fact, your dick is not yeah. fireproof. <laughs> I don't want to know how Ross knows that. <clears throat> yeah, that's a we'll that one for the next episode. <laughs> yeah, that's a different show. Yep. Very different show. <laughs> Christ. Um, I can't believe I said that out loud. I know. I was like, uh, and you left the door open to the next joke. Like I just seriously. Anyway. That was a, um, a softball underhanded, right? Exactly. It was he said it on the T. Oh, <laughs> well, Ross, we've kind of gone through your your deadline. Yeah, yep. yeah, we, we've we've run right past my uh, my hard yeah, stop. Sorry, guys. Yeah, I, uh, no, I you're great, it. man. No, dude, that's good. It's good. It's the whole point of the show is to have long talks about stuff. So, yep, yep. Um, almost all, all of which is true. Almost, yeah, all. almost all. Dick part. I don't know the if your dick's <laughs> flammable or not. I'm not sure if that's that could be true. Could be not oh, true. Yeah. Use protection. Use protection. Yes, use protection. Fire safety. Fire safety. Oh, fire. Yeah, All the way around. Fire uh, oh, man. I'll wrap it up real fast. You can rate review. To go there. Yeah, you can rate review the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Some people might not be tuning in again after yep. this one. <laughs> just scare the last of our listeners away. The one. Um, uh, do us a favor. Like and subscribe on YouTube. Follow us on Spotify. Spotify actually tells us how many people please. follow. That's a very nice number to see and then talk to potential advertisers with. So you can follow Matt on Instagram at Petty Cash Racing. Uh, definitely find him on Facebook as well. I'm sure Gracie's going to have her own page eventually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can follow Hooniverse, The Hooniverse on Twitter, The Real Hooniverse on Instagram. Is Twitter still a thing? I went five days without logging into my Twitter account while I was on that Utah trip. And I don't know that I ever need to get back into it. Fuck it um, up. Probably not, especially right now. And Ross yeah, is especially no, right now. <laughs> yeah, Ross is no not like the one from Friends on Instagram. And I'm at Overlanding Dad. And we did it. We did a show. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Hey, it worked. It it worked. Works. Yes. <laughs> Despite Gracie's best efforts in the beginning there. Dude, but she took a uh, sweet nap. Yeah, she uh she's she's a sweet pup. And you know, I I'm on the board of directors for a uh a charity for homeless youth, and it was like Stop this cute puppers and I'm like I can't be a hypocrite. Come on, she needs uh she needs a home too. So yeah. She uh looks like she's taking pretty well to you after two days. You know. Some some dogs after two days would be a little a little skittish and, and whatnot. She just definitely wants uh all the loves, all the attention. Yeah. She loves a Land Cruiser. See Ooh, that's all perfect dog. All about it.